Our first live speaker for today will be Miss Wender with her talk entitled, It's So Random. First of all, I'd like to thank Christian and Emma for bringing this to McDonough. For years I've been looking at Ted's speeches online, and now I'm slightly awestruck to actually be giving one myself. So what is random? Randomness is a series of unconnected and independent events. And in numbers, you can think of long, long strings of digits. Uniformly distributed and equally likely to occur. Let's see, we'll try this. I see already I've, I've misplaced something, but why is this intriguing to me? Even before I could read, I was really interested in patterns, whether it be the ridges in cloth, the patterns in cloth, flowers, um, even the stones in my driveway growing up. I was always looking for patterns. I didn't know why. But it just sort of satisfied something inside me. Take the flower, for instance. You see, it looks like concentric circles, and it's really a spiral. Now, I would have taken that flower apart, bit by bit, to watch those, those spirals and those circles unfold. Now, as I, I lived in the country, I had plenty of time and space to observe everything that went on around me. And you know, as I would sit there and observe and try and find patterns and be intrigued by these things that didn't have patterns, I would think about lots of things and maybe other TED Talks in the future, infinity. If I looked at a blade of grass, who was to say there wasn't another universe on that blade of grass? So I was a little strange as a child. I will admit that. <laughs> um, but what that did to me, what this power of observation did, was to sort of open my mind and let me be flexible. And that's carried through for the rest of my life. But then, all of a sudden, I found things that didn't have a pattern. For instance, I love mud puddles. And watching rain in a puddle, just listen and watch for a couple seconds. discernible pattern to the raindrops, no discernible rhythm to the sounds of the rain. So there's, sorry. Okay. So there's an example of not finding a pattern. So there are lots of things in life that don't seem to have a pattern like that. If you look at the leaves in a tree, for instance, it seems random. Now, how do we use randomness in, in sort of not everyday life, maybe, but in life in general? And how do we, as people who naturally seek patterns, achieve this randomness? For instance, a computer simulation. You might be playing a game, or you might be testing out a jet airplane. You don't think you put the airplane together and you go out and fly it, do you? I mean, people put in, they use random numbers to generate situations. Now, how do we get these random numbers? There are algorithms or methods that scientists have described that essentially, uh, some of them may take like a starting number and then go way, way out into an expansion of pi. Some irrational number that we all know goes on, it never repeats and it never terminates, right? So we have what are called mathematical algorithms produce random numbers. Now, these are actually called pseudo-algorithms. You look at the left, that doesn't look very random. It looks like a pattern in a material, doesn't it? But on the right over there, this is a bitmap of something generated what, by, by what people call, in quotes, a true random number generator. It starts out with atmospheric noise and goes on from there. That looks pretty random to me. Is it to you? Now, Mr. Schmidt's going to have some more to say about that later. Now, one visual, another visual example of randomness is a random walk. Suppose you make a bet. 
a dollar bet, and you have a 50% chance of winning the bet or a 50% chance of losing the bet. So if you string together a bunch of win wins, you accumulate a pot of money, right? So this guy on the left is a random walk of about 100 steps. And you can see that we're kind of going away from zero. We're kind of staying. This is not a good day for the gambler. He's losing. But if you go over here, this is the same walk extended to four, almost 5,000 steps. And what's happening is, sure you have a losing streak, then you have a winning streak, and then we're back in the losing streak. Now, if you really study this, and I did this in graduate school, you can actually predict, like if I'm at that, the peak of the second, the guy on the right there, how long it's going to take me to get back to zero, or what the probability is that I'm ever going to get back to zero. Now, let's move out of science and math and look at music. Now, anybody, anybody here is taking music theory? There's tons of rules, right? And your mind boggles at the rules. This is Wolfram's um, ad, uh, random music generator. Now, it sets up rules. It sets up a key, or you can even do some exotic mode, like, I don't know, mixolydian or something. But let's take a listen to what happens when the notes within those rules are generated randomly. This is a wonderful thing. You should go here sometime and just experiment with all the different types of music. That's enough. <laughs> Thank you. Now, from here, let's move to art. This is sort of the last thing I want to show you. All right. If you had a digital art piece where you're just generating pixels, it's easy to understand how you could use one of these random number generators and get there. But I've often gone to a museum and I've looked at something and said, I think I could do that. Right? You've all had that experience. And probably the most emblematic artist is Jackson Pollock. It looks like he just took paint and squiggled it over everything. Now, when he started out, his stuff was much more representational. You could actually tell what was going on. This is called Lavender Mist. I don't see anything there. I like it. There's something appealing to it. But it looks really random. Now, here is Jackson Pollock's tape on painting at the end of his career. I enjoy working on a large canvas. I feel more at home more at ease in a big area. Having the canvas on the floor, I feel nearer, more of a part of the painting. This way I can walk around it, work from all four sides, and be in the painting, similar to the Indian fan fingers of the West. Sometimes I use a brush, but often prefer using a stick. Sometimes I pour the paint straight out of the can. I like to use a dripping fluid paint. I also use sand, broken glass, pebbles, string, nails, or other foreign matter. A method of painting is the natural growth out of a need. I want to express my feelings rather than illustrate them. The technique is just a means of arriving at a statement. When I am painting, I have a general notion as to what I am about. I can control the flow of the paint. There is no accident. That is, there is no beginning and no end. Sometimes I lose the painting. But I have no fear of changes, of destroying the image. Because the painting has a life of its own, I try to let it live. So it's not so rare, after all. Now, so you've seen a lot of different examples. This is a subject that you can go into incredibly deeply. But what I encourage you to do is to go out find the patterns, and enjoy the, one, the things that you find that don't have patterns. Thank you.